yesterday we really began by focusing on the, the science and its implications for refugees, and we talked a little bit about uh, not only the conceptual ideas behind uh, developing brains in children, but we also thought about the implications of that for our coverage. Um, today, we're going to ask, how does that science get applied in the real world? How does knowledge, new knowledge, recent knowledge about child development, about resilience, about trauma, get translated into action and into policy. Um, and I should say, as we do this, that part of the principle behind all of this, and that it's important for our reporting, is to remember that we're not trying to pathologize people. We're not trying to make families or kids into um, universally diagnosed head cases. To the contrary, resilience is the norm, and a lot of uh, what we'll be talking about today will be ways of enhancing resilience, ways of taking advantage of the natural resources that people have, even while dealing with the real impact of crisis. Um, we are very fortunate uh, to have with us Dr. Mohammed Abo Hilal, who some of you have gotten to know socially. He's been kind enough to hang out with us for the last few days. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about his, his how he's going to speak to us and how we'll uh, work the discussion, but let me just give you his biography. Uh, Muhammad Abu Halal, MD, is a clinical psychiatrist who founded Syria Bright Future to help Syrian refugees, particularly children. Its programs include one-on-one -on -one therapy and group sessions that try to help children cope with nightmares and flashbacks. Syria Bright Future also offers activities to help children deal with day-to-day -day challenges of being refugees. In the Zatari refugee camp, Syria Bright Future provides awareness sessions for teenagers on underage marriage and gender-based violence and safe spaces for younger children to play. And I'm sure he will talk about some of that. Um, he's also here because Dr. Habo Hilal is himself a refugee who fled Syria in 2011. Um, he may choose to talk about some of that. Um, he's going to talk for a few minutes and then to take advantage of the other mental health expertise in the room, um, we will also bring back up from yesterday Marsha Brof Brophy from International Medical Corps and Khaled Nasser, psychologist uh, from Beirut, who you met yesterday and who will join Dr. Abo Hilal on the table and discuss further the implications of what he is saying. But now for our, our morning keynote, I look forward to hearing you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Bruce, uh, very much for inviting me and having me here. Thank you, Ariel, uh, for all the great work you, you did. And thank you for everybody to attending. Um, uh, Although I am a trainer and I speak a lot, but I always feel like I have social anxiety. So please uh, be kind with me and uh, help me in like delivering my speech. Um, I'm a psychiatrist. I don't know how many of you knows the difference between a psychiatrist and psychologist. Can you raise hands if you know the difference? Just the difference between psychiatrist and psychologist. Okay. So we guys write medications, okay? They only talk, okay? <laughs> so this is the big difference. Uh, now, we can talk, but they can't prescribe medication, okay? <laughs> so this is the big difference, actually, between us. <clears throat> However, I consider myself as defector from psychiatry and the medical world toward more, not even psychotherapy, is more psychosocial uh, approaches. Uh, I find it more appealing and more humanistic, actually, 
to look that way. And we will see how that evolved. Actually, we started um, so let me see what shall I join? Okay. So bright future for refugee children. Uh, actually, we started in 2008. Uh, I had a training for one year in the United States, and I learned a new perspective in psychiatry, multidisciplinary approaches, and I came to Syria. And I thought, we need to do something in our field, because in Syria, uh, psychiatry has a lot of stigma, and uh, predominantly is by psychiatrists who only prescribe medication. And there's a lot of uh, bad attitudes about like, psychiatry in general. And there's also this conflict between psychologists and psychiatrists. So I said, OK, let's do some social change here. And we formed a group called Syrian Psychology. So I didn't call it Sy Syrian Psychiatry. I call it Syrian Psychology. And we gathered psychiatrists psychologists and people who are interested in mental health. So it's like multidisciplinary, and this was like among first initiatives to do uh, in Syria that gather all these people. Now, in 2011, I think you can expect what will happen. And of course, as uh, social change agents, we involved in what we call a uh, revolution although other media call it different names, but it is still for us a revolution for freedom, for democracy. Uh, of course, our voice has, has disappeared among all the battles that have been over years, but we still hear. Um, I told Ariel, I will try to dry it as much as I can, but so see it from uh, more uh, humanistic, uh, humanistic uh, approach is not political. So, but just to, to, to know what what drive us actually to work. Um, I I was detained for 70 days at the end of 2011, and for me as a psychiatrist, it was a um, very difficult experience. Actually, it was like a existential experience that uh, changed my life actually till now. Um, and after I was released, I flee to Jordan. Uh, in Jordan, um, of course, my network also has become either wanted or fleeing. So we regathered again in Jordan. Uh, and because things uh, went in, in different direction in the Syrian revolution, we said that we need to focus on our profession. So we started visiting senior refugees in Jordan, in camps, in uh, injured people, uh, trying to do some, uh, some psychosocial like uh, activities. And we formed uh, uh, what we call a psychosocial support team. And uh, luckily we got uh, support from one of the international NGOs, MDM. Uh, then we learned that there's something called NGOs. We never, we never know about NGOs before, actually. Although we are do, uh, like working as NGO, but this is a new term. Uh, and by the way, I mean, when we went to Jordan, it became like, like we are going to Europe in the world of NGOs, because a lot of NGOs here in Jordan, we never uh, heard about this in, like, in Syria. Uh, so we established here about future. And here there's like a joke, because when we're discussing what we will name, <laughs> Name this uh, organization. So one thought is Syria Future Path. But I said, no, uh, Syrians can't Brune Bruneians differentiate between B and P. So if it is path, they will say ba uh, bath. So, <laughs> so just change it. Uh, so I, we named it like Syria Brati Future. OK? Uh, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, uh, our team has attracted Jordanian 
uh, psychology student join our team to be trained, okay? Then when our colleagues, Jordanian colleagues, graduated, uh, we support them in establishing their twin organization, Bright Future for Mental Health, as a Jordanian organization. And actually, we work together as two uh, organizations. Uh, after it was registered, so we get a formal big uh, fund from MDM, and that enabled us to work in Zatari camp, and also in Erbed and Amman, psychiatric clinic, and uh, psychology, uh, psychotherapy, and also psychosocial activities, different types in uh, Zatari camp. Uh, I wrote an article about our work, it was published in American Psychology Association, uh, Peace and Conflict uh, Branch, and I called it Beyond Survival. And this, this name comes from we in psychiatry or psychology try not to deal with the, with the clients as the victims, but as a survival. So we need to change their like, attitudes. You are not victims, you are survival. So what I meant that we went beyond survival actually, and we were able to establish maybe one of the uh, first organizations specialized uh, in uh, mental health in Jordan. And we were able to provide services in host community, and also our organization became a place where psychology graduates can attend and take their internship. And later on, one of the private uh, uh, universities sent their master students to have a training in, in the organization. So I call it like beyond survival. Also, we had a, a, a video uh, published in New York Times. I will show it at the end of the lecture uh, about our work. Uh, so this is the article, this is the video. Now, at the end of 2014, we moved to Turkey. Uh, we registered there formally uh, under our name, Syria Brought Future. Uh, and we start to work inside Syria in all what we call it liberated areas which is out of control of regime. It was Dar'a, it was Eastern Damascus, Eastern Ghouta, it was uh, Middle Homs, and it was like uh, uh, North. Um, we had some administrative uh, issues, challenges, and lastly, we established a new vision and mission around integrating MHPSS, which is mental health, psychosocial support services in other sectors. Now, when it comes to children, it's become apparent how difficult situations and uh, events and traumas will affect their lives. And yesterday you heard a lot, from biological to all other aspects. Um, sometimes we feel like, why we are repeating all this? I mean, all people know that this war and this crisis is affecting the children. Uh, they affecting their physical, cognitive, emotional, social, spiritual life. Uh, and this can be manifested in effects on their play, their social interaction, academic achievement, trust in the world, and uh, also the most serious is when they get to adolescence, that age, where a problem will start. And there's a study in Ireland, actually, that showed the psychiatric and psychological problems started 10 years after the war has stopped. So the idea, even if you don't see now the effect in children, when they are become adolescent, you will see a lot of, of, of problems. Now, to give some life to academic information, let me mention quickly some few examples. So one of children that has his hand amputated because war, he will ask his father, Dad, would my hand grow up again? The second one who was rescued from building after it was 
crushed. Uh, she told the rescuer, uncle, don't tear my pajama. It's just new. To see how it's valuable for them to have a new pajama. That this is the first thing that came to my, their mind, although they are about to die. Third one, uh, a, a children who lived for five years in besieged area. When he moved to north, and he, he was introduced with an uphill. And he would ask, uphill. I, I must, uh, good, right? Uphill, okay. Uh, he would ask his father, our family, what is this? Is it a bump? So you can imagine that five-year-old don't know apples. He knows pumps. So I think we can't say more about these uh, stories. Now, some uh, theoretical information that I think it's important. So all psychological uh, professionals working in humanitarian world will use this IASC guidelines that <laughs> you heard about yesterday. So they said in there's four levels of services that we provide to people who are in a crisis. First level, when you are providing services like relief, uh, health, any other services, you need to take care or took in your consideration the mental health aspects. That means, uh, and badly there's a, a lot of incidents, like if you want to distribute basket food, you need to keep the dignity of people, not having all the basket in a car, then all people coming around and, uh, you know, uh, uh, fighting with each other, just who will take it you need to distribute it in a way that saves their dignity. So this need to be for 100 people, 100% 100 of all people. Don't provide any humanitarian services if you don't take this in your consideration, uh, uh, mental health and protection issues. Otherwise, you are harming. You are harming. We have people. I remember when we first came to Jordan, we were visiting families and pushing them to go to UNCR to register and get some help because it's their rights. And people will, would refuse. No, we, are, we, we don't take this uh, aid. But after two years, people, they become crowded in UCR and they want to take uh, basket tools and they will fight with each other. So we spoil the ethical morals of people if we don't provide services in, in, in a very careful way. So this needs to be taken into consideration. Now, the second level, what we call it, uh, non-focused, non-specialized, that focus in rebuilding the social networks, families, uh, routines that have been the community, and this also help all the community, actually. All people want some places to go, visit, socialize. And this is uh, very important, actually, to know what was in the community before the crisis, then to rebuild it. Schools, mosques, uh, cafes, any other social activities, you need to rebuild it. And this will help uh, a lot of uh, uh, people. Now, some people will still have psychological stress, psychological problems that can't be held by only engaging in like child free spaces or, or other activity. So they need to be moved to the third level, what we call it focused, non-specialized. Focused mean either one-to-one -one or a group. Non-specialized means the service will be provided by lay people who get the training for like weeks and supervision for like months. They can provide a few sessions, like five sessions in counseling and supporting, either for adults or for children, okay? 
and th this will help also like maybe 20% of, of people, okay? Now, if people did not help by this, if they have severe mental disorder, then they will be referred to more specialized services where we have psychiatrist or psychotherapist. Psychiatrist or psychotherapist. And here only we talk about disorders. Only here we talk about mental disorders. All that below, we don't talk about mental disorders. We see psychological distress, psychological problems. We don't diagnose. And we don't need to diagnose, actually. In the third level, you still able to provide service without need to label him. He is depressed, he is ADHD, he is BTSD. There's no need for that, okay? I think this is very important for you to know when you engage in this, in this uh, world of uh, mental health and psychosocial support services. Now, the interventions with, chil uh, with the children, the last uh, approach, issued by UNICEF, actually. It's very interesting. And this is what we now trying to embrace, is what we call community-based approach. Community-based approach. So in the beginning, we will focus only on children or individuals. But it turns that the problem is interconnected. So you will have the child with his physical development, cognitive development, and social, spiritual, emotional development. This is the child. But this child is living in a family where there's parents or caregivers. They have their own problems, their own attitudes, their own mental health problems, okay? And they are living in a community where there is like a traditions, there is attitude, there is uh, uh, misinformation, bad uh, practices, and all of them are living in a big society and culture. Spiritual, religious, political, all these. So, and in all levels, you have a risk factors that increase the possibility of a problem, and you have a protective factors. So this is the approach that needs to be embraced by anybody working with the children. You can't sectorize children. You can't lay la layerize children. You need to work vertically and horizontally and holistic approach, actually, and focusing on the best interest of this uh, child. Uh, so our service as Cerebrati Future uh, as integrative, we start to integrate psychosocial support in education. So we will train teachers in schools about psychosocial aspects so they can be able to deal with stressed children while they are tra uh, uh, teaching them. Uh, we did a project with, uh, 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 where we uh, include psychosocial support with nutrition or feeding, uh, baby, small feed, uh, babies' feedings. Uh, like, we will support the uh, uh, lactating woman psychologically so she be able to take care of her child. And actually, it was like a new trend now and more organization now trying to involve this integrative because usually they do only nutrition like our feeding. Uh, BSS with health. So we have uh, psychosocial workers in each primary health care. So there's like primary health care when they provide uh, health services, you will have a psychosocial uh, workers who can provide uh, service on the third level. And if they need more specialized, they will refer it to more specialized uh, centers in the, in the area. Uh, and uh, we, we used uh, a program called Teaching Recovery Techniques, which teaching children a techniques to deal with uh, uh, stress. And this is, was old, and now we, we revisit uh, the validity of this approach, actually. Uh, Child-free spaces, also, where children are playing, but you need to be uh, uh, noticing any symptoms or any problems, so you take care of this child and refer it to for more, more uh, 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 services. And also we look to the 
more positive side to build on their capacity. And we had a, a very uh, small initiative, but very uh, uh, great, is like to teach them programming. So you can imagine that a 10-year-old um, who can uh, program or, or code a beige for him. So this is type of like you building on their uh, resilience. Um, now, last thing that, did you hear about a uh, term called trauma? Please raise, raise your hand. Okay, raise your hands. Okay, all, all of you. All of you, right? Okay, now, did you hear about term resilience? Okay, resilience. Okay, now. Did you hear about term PTG? Okay. Okay, so this is uh, the opposite of PT is D. So, so people when are facing the trauma, okay, we have three opportunities, like or three choices. So either they got symptoms of PTSD, regardless of it is like a, a full mental disorder or just symptoms, okay? And this is small percentage. And you get a big percentage who are resilient. That means they able to receive this trauma and rebounds back to their life without any help. Okay, so this is resilience. But you have a small percentage of people who life will change for better. So it is post traumatic growth. Post traumatic growth. That means you f you can find in our like people who before this uh, uh, revolution and all these events, he would like focusing on some you know trivial things actually, but after all this trauma that happened, he become having more purpose, important purpose in life. He become active in helping others or forming organizations or, or doing a lot of, of things. Now, the tricky thing is the person or the child can have three of them at once. So, how can that be happen? We can give an example. So, if a tortured person still having nightmares, okay, that disturb his, his sleep. So he has some type of PTSD or one of the symptoms of PTSD. But his work did not affect, affected. So he is resilient. And then he formed uh, maybe an initiative to help his fellow, I'm sorry, to help his fellow people. So this is a growth. He would never th do that before he was like arrested because, you know, but now he has more purpose in life. So I wanted to point for this because you need to see people like this, what they have problems and also what they have strength or new thing that, that uh, developed. Uh, I will show you like, quickly uh, the video that uh, published by New York Times about our war. Okay, so, okay. Uh, and uh, this, so this story uh, filmed in 2004, and they filmed for over two, three days, more than seven hours. And I don't know how this journalist like, cut everything for five, six minutes, like it was like. So, so I need your feedback actually about this. And uh, yeah, I mean, we can discuss it and uh, okay. So it's only four minutes. <laughs> Ali Samara's daughter died in Syria when an airstrike hit his home. His surviving daughter saw her twin sister killed beside her. 
عفني هيتي يعني بس شفت اختي مقتوله اول شيء كنا هاتين يعني بس لما شفت اختي مقتوله هيتي صرت عصبيه كثير يعني هسه انا شوي عصبيه ما بقدر يعني اذا واحد حكى لي دغري بطلع ما اجينا لهون على الاردن طبعا بقيت الاطفال بسوريا يعني احس عمرضان نفسيا This generation are the future of Syria. If you don't help them to cope, to get the uh, needed skills to deal with this situation, they will be a future a problem. Muhammad Abu Hilal is a Syrian psychiatrist and a refugee. He's on a mission to help fellow Syrians traumatized by the war, children in particular. <laughs> He started Bright Future, a mental health organization. They help children cope with their trauma. After five years of war, four million people have fled the country. Two million are children. You will have aggressive behavior. You will have uh, problems in schools. You will have uh, children who will, uh, adolescents who will take uh, drugs and forming gangs and um, uh, also just having disrupted uh, social life. So he's trying to help them with art therapy. In PTSD, you have a nightmares. So one technique to combat nightmares is to draw them. Like here, the helicopter that used to bomb now is sending balloons. <laughs> and here people who were fighting, now they are just um, handshaking. Another technique is visualization. While these strategies aren't a proven cure for trauma, they allow children to gain some control over thoughts and feelings and start thinking about the future again. Memories of his imprisonment and torture by the Assad regime. Actually, it is a very terrible experience to be arrested in these circumstances. And you, from philosophical and psychological point of view, you hit the bottom of all life. When he was released, he fled to Jordan with his wife and three children. His eight-year-old daughter draws pictures of Syria. This is a small baby who died. Actually, this is the chemical weapon attack. I have a, a duty to do it, as if I am dead, but I was granted a new life. Abu Hilal's organization runs three centers in Jordan. Beyond treating trauma, they offer activities and awareness campaigns for child refugees. They are working together and sharing ideas and trying to come up with decisions. But Abu Hilal knows it's not enough. All what we did, maybe we covered like 10,000, 20,000 ch child, but there's millions out there waiting for, for this uh, help. An example of survival. We didn't accept the status of victim. I hope that this will give a hope and model for many areas in the world that you can do something. Thank you. Khaled and Nasir, why don't you join us? Thank you, Mohammed, for that, and, and not only for the insight into your work, but into how your own experience drives it. Um, 
Marcia and Howard, I'm wondering first if you had any comments or thoughts that you would like to just add or respond to, any immediate responses uh, to what Mohammed raised for us? No, 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 maybe the, the, the last, uh, when you were mentioning like the three layers, mm -hmm. I think like you embody them at the same time to a certain extent, like there's the growth in you as well. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I, want, I wanted to pick up on the post-traumatic growth as well. There is a lot of uh, yeah. research that's been conducted in areas like Sri Lanka after 25 years of civil war. Um, and then as, as you were saying about kind of the problems not maybe coming out until like five, ten years after peace as such, because in Sri Lanka I know many governments and donors pumped in a lot of money around reconciliation projects and activities after the conflict ceased and uh, everyone felt that that was sufficient. And I mean like billions of dollars went into these reconciliation projects. Um, but there are still issues there in the communities, particularly in the north, um, in terms of economic deprivation, lack of opportunity, lack of hopeless, um, well, hopelessness for the future. Um, and so I think it, you know, it's very important. It's one of the countries, many other countries as well, how, where their researchers have been, their own Sri Lankan researchers have been trying to document post-traumatic growth and how you may, you may go off in a completely different course of life, um, even if you hadn't experienced that war yourself, if you weren't even born during that conflict, how that ramification and, and a lot of work, again, from Sri Lanka, I think will mirror here where we see that, um, and I think um, it was mentioned yesterday, I can't remember by who, but that um, generational transmission of trauma or distress or lack of hope um, and a lack of uh, belonging, potentially, and also maybe in some ways, I think maybe for this region is quite distinct, but I'll... I'll ask you this question around um, a lack of connection and, and uh, a loss of identity. And we talked about it in the group yesterday afternoon about uh, being called refugee all the time versus other terms. Even though you are technically a refugee, how that supports losing that identity. Um, so I think there's some really interesting concepts coming out here that yeah. really um, are meaningful for new stories, for people to understand the work, but also for us as um, mental health practitioners about what kind of activities we need to be delivering to support communities. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask all of you something. I know as I looked at the video and think about the wonderful idea of providing treatment for the individual kids and their families, it, it's so deeply moving to see those kids in the room but the a question that immediately runs to my mind is the scale of the crisis is so overwhelming and the scale of need is so overwhelming. How do you scale up therapeutic interventions so that they're reaching more than a handful, the handful of kids who can come through your clinic? How do we, how do we think about that? Any, any of you? Um, from a, my personal experience, I don't try to look at it from this perspective because mm -hmm. it's so overwhelming and it would be disappointing for what I do. Mm -hmm. For me, if I'm helping one or two people, um, this is my, my, my satisfaction yeah. and I get my energy from working on this specific target to a certain extent. Um, because, I mean, maybe like it's, I'm doing a bit of my share Hopefully others will also do. So it's not like, if I look at it from this micro perspective, it's very disappointing. Mm -hmm. So I try to avoid it. Yeah. Um, actually, I, uh, as I said, like now I can't see like patient uh, especially traumatized yeah. myself. Like yeah. it's like difficult for me. It's easy to see schizophrenic or other, yeah. problem, but I mean traumatized myself, I can't see. It. So I have another like uh, job as like, because I have master in business administration, project management and program management. Mm -hmm. So I'm more administrative mm -hmm. work. And this is question actually relevant because we are working in Syrian context where we have a lot of organization actually that working in psychosocial support and mental health in, in North, but still it is like uh, not not enough. So this is question all, uh, always uh, uh, in there. So what we trying to do with our colleagues in, in, in other organization is, is first to, to, do, to have a system actually mm -hmm. of coordination mm -hmm. 
and to be sure that all the layers are there mm -hmm. and to uh, 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 support others to embrace this holistic approach where if relief organizations start to do their part mm -hmm. on the first level, uh, other protection and other organization work in second level and there's uh, psychosocial support workers where we can train them on like uh, within a few weeks and supervise them then they can provide a lot of, of help and uh, to train psychiatrists or uh, uh, doctors on psychiatry so this is actually what we we are in the process to, to do mm -hmm. still needs high but this is in our mind actually uh, to do that um, yeah, I, I'd like to add to that. So I think so if I speak now with my International Medical Corps current hat on, um, I think there's there's different needs and ways to scale up. So I think so um, for International Medical Corps, we'll work at that. If we think about that, that intervention pyramid that you um, showed, um, for IMC working at that top layer is around, as you already um, discussed, uh, training up existing doctors, national doctors who are in those local communities, in those primary health care centres. It may also be nurses and community health workers, but specifically at that specialised level, um, World Health Organisation has a fantastic training package that can be um, quickly disseminated to medically trained doctors to enable them to then diagnose and treat so they're, be, they're becoming like paraprofessional psychiatrists in a way mm -hmm. with clinical supervision and support but that obviously requires then the medication to be in place as well and sometimes that's difficult to get the medication into certain locations. Um, so that's one layer of doing it and that actually works significantly well in terms of building capacity quickly yeah. um, and with well-trained uh, and qualified staff. The, the layers, I guess, for IMC, though, if we then go to the bottom layer, and not bottom as in it's the least significant at all, it's the largest layer of the pyramid and the most significant, but around building up communities. So there's something there, again, which both colleagues have already touched on, where you want to empower the communities to give them so a sense of hope and a sense of connection, which are all kind of well-being, positive mental health ticks, but also um, you reach the, the greatest number of people quite quickly, mm -hmm. and they know their communities. So you work again with, it could be the taxi driver or the hairdresser who previously knew a lot of the communities. And we're talking now, not just now, eight years on, but like at the beginning for the first two, three, four, five, six years, they know their communities, they know who was doing what before the war and working with them to do the more kind of lay psychosocial support and that's around knowing how to recognise symptoms, not PTSD but symptoms of distress and anger and frustration or hopelessness, maybe someone's looking anxious day to day now and they're never used to, maybe someone's talking about having nightmares and sleeplessness, so helping them realise and talk about those issues, so small local self-help groups, that could be in the coffee shop, in the barber shop, wherever those normal previous to the conflict locations would be where we would so all of us would be socializing and hanging out it's reconnecting to those spaces and getting the communities to support each other and that to me is the largest and quickest way of scaling up in terms of provision and, and I, then you I, target and I can the imagine parents. stories that, that there's kind of a good journalism focus in that because they're community spaces and all that I, I also wanted to ask something else yesterday in our kind of brain science briefings we heard a lot about the importance of children having buffering and of the folks who are in the parental or caregiving role. When you're talking about deeply traumatized or distressed uh, refugee children, very often their caregivers, their parents, or may not themselves be in a position to be very good buffers or may be suffering a lot. Um, Mohammed, how much do you, and any of you too, how, how much do you end up working with the parents? And how do you do that alongside working with kids? Um, the program you saw in, in the video, this is yeah. the teaching recovery technique. So it is five sessions for children, but there's two sessions for family, okay. to uh, telling them how to deal with their children. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be honest, I mean, at the beginning we were not like so uh, informed actually about like 
the importance of engaging. But now it's it's more as I showed you the UNICEF like a circle. Now it is like more you need to deal with the ch uh, child, their family, and they're all like a community and involve all the actors actually yeah. to to get the the best uh, results. So this is new for us, and this is now reflected in our training for our new psychosocial worker. Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, is that. Um, you cannot approach this um, the kid from just like as an individual. He's a part of a system, so it's it's a, it's a system approach. Um, many times, those kids uh, they get the interpretation of what's right, what's wrong, what's safe, what's not safe, from even the face of their mother. If I do th put this, I, I put it here, and I look at my mother and she's smiling. This means it's positive. If she's no, she's like. Furious. This means that it's, it's negative. I, I, I put it back. Uh, so the interpretation of life in general is the child get it uh, uh, from the face of the mother. At least, I mean, based on the, as as many mentioned, like many studies are done on mother's child relationship. Um, but so this is why, uh, in, in a way, um, and many times, mental problems happen first with parents that are more concerned, worried, anxious about life in general, and they transmit this anxiety to the child um, and, and becomes hereditary to a certain extent, like it's, it's transmission from one generation to another. So the problem is not an individual, it's, it's a whole system and frequently uh, work is more effective with parents at this stage mm -hmm. to try to kind of uh, help them buffer mm -hmm. what's happening outside from what's happening inside home. Try to, as much as possible, serve the storm outside, but at least keep the stability at home to a certain extent. Yeah. I think for, the, uh, for Save the Children and for International Medical Corps, it comes down to the community-based uh, psychosocial support work again. And so um, we wouldn't necessarily uh, develop sessions or groups where we um, advertise it as mental health or psychosocial support but it would be maybe more around for livelihood opportunities so coming to learn new livelihood skills where it can support people for uh, economic growth um, if there if and when there are opportunities for them or entrepreneurial uh, programs um, and then specifically if we I mean so that's for men and women um, of all ages um, but also then uh, we also work around um, for, as you already mentioned as well, around nutrition programs. And it was mentioned yesterday as well about integrating, um, not just for breastfeeding mothers, but for families in general around nutrition programs coming in. And so for, for at least Save the Children and for IMC, trying to work as well with World Food Program, ensuring that um, the, the team, say if we're thinking about in refugee camps, um, that the World Food Program uh, teams who hand out the food rations or are there at the, the shops where, where communities are going to come um, purchase their food, reminding them to sprinkle in well-being and positive mental health messages. Whether that's just kind of like, how are you doing today? How did you sleep? Have you remembered this technique about deep breathing? Or whatever it is, or anxiousness or depression, and having that human contact day to day, again, is a really simple um, an effective well-being tick, should we call it? So, f so one of the key messages you have specific activities that are MHPSS, but you have to sprinkle that work through our every activity that you deliver. Uh, actually, our project with nutrition was in partnership with Cyril Shredin in southern Syria, and actually we were planning to uh, develop it to to include livelihood with BSS, but unfortunately. Everything stopped when <laughs> changing on the ground. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, this, is a this is a picture, a photo of, uh, taken by Selgado, Seb Sebastião Selgado. He's a Brazilian photographer. Um, um, actually, after this, uh, he, he took so many, um, he covered so many battles, tensions in the region uh, globally. Uh, and directly after the Rwanda genocides and, and the tensions, he stopped. Um, he, he, in a way, he was traumatized to a certain extent, and he stopped f uh, taking pictures uh, for nine years. Um, and he went back to Brazil to work in, in a, in, uh, on his farm. What, what, do you say, what do you see in this picture? Mother and child. Yes, it's, it's, it's a camp. 
it's a messy, chaotic, right? And but look at the child's the, the expression. She's happy. She's looking at her mother. So it's a very symbolic of kind of what usually happens is the child does not know this. The, she, she's a, uh, a girl. Uh, doesn't know what's happening around her. If the mother is smiling, what's around her is nice and to a certain extent safe. The key here is in the safety aspect for children. Um, so the moment the mother is crying, this means that it's, there's something wrong. Um, so this is key in terms of understanding the child, the child's perspective is they interpret things from their parents mainly. Uh, even if we as grown-ups will look at this and say, wow, this is so bad. Okay, yeah. so... I, I, actually, it's interesting. At dinner uh, last night, Cecilia made... Do you, why don't you make the, the observation that you made at dinner? Do you remember, or, or do I need to remember? I don't know. Well, none of the ones that had to do with dancing and whatever. But, uh, um, can we get, a, get, get, get you to a mic? Uh, there we go. Uh, I guess we were just emphasizing on the fact of the importance of creating these magic moments between the caregivers and children. And in any different context, and it doesn't have to be a, con a, a, a context of crisis or conflict, it can be a, a context of poverty as well. Uh, so I've been in many favelas in Brazil or in many slums in India, where you can see like very difficult uh, build environment around the, the children, but you still see these magic connections between caregivers and children, which actually allows children to have this resilience to go over very difficult moments. Yeah. And I, I remember your story, so I am very happy that you brought it back, uh, your personal story uh, that you share with me. And I was remembering even stories about my childhood and the fact that when, when I, I saw my mom at some point when I was very ill with malaria, just like with this phase that she was worried. And then I realized, oh my God, I'm really sick. Um, and, the, and this is the kind of situation that I, I think it's very important for children just to, to understand that the, the challenges that children are going through are related a lot with what happens with their immediate environment and their Im immediate context. And we can definitely make, through improving caregivers' well-being, we can make the context of children much better. Yeah, and I think you also said something which stuck with me in thinking about reporting, which is that, that a child in an affluent family with a parent, but a, a parent who has horrible chronic depression, may be at more developmental risk than a child in a refugee camp if the bond is not there, right? And, and, and I think that's an important perspective to remember. I want to ask one journalism craft sort of question, and then we'll turn it to the room. Um, Mohammed, I'm, I'm sure you noticed yesterday that we started to get into this very interesting question of how to get reporters access to kids. And I noticed, couldn't help but notice that in the video, all these children were on camera. Did, did you have to, what did you negotiate with the New York Times? How did that relationship go that you agreed to put the kids on camera? Actually, I mean, of course, you need to take like, the permission of uh, children uh, and their families to be filmed. Uh, but actually, we didn't like face a lot of problems actually in like their willingness actually to uh, to be on uh, on spot. And there's like part that I didn't show actually one of stressed like uh, children that I was uh, having. So uh, sometimes they feel like okay, I can. If my story are are there, can benefit like mm -hmm. to to show my 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 suffering, for example, that yeah. can be uh, helping others. So uh, uh, I think this is uh, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I didn't find like difficulties like in in, in this. Yeah. Can I add to yeah, yeah. my observation? My observation on that is also was um, it was a positive news story. It was about strengths. It was about them. Um, l learning how to calm themselves. They, they didn't look particularly distressed in that video, nor should they be, because they're in your very capable hands. So they were learning relaxation techniques, they were learning um, you know, group activities in terms of problem solving. So it's very positive, it's about assets, it's about um, resilience and how to move forward. And so you know, that's maybe why it was 
a strong and easier story to get permission from the children and for you to feel professionally comfortable with it as well, compared to some news stories where, which we were talking about yesterday around where mm -hmm. you want to have the horrifying story and the horrific images. Mm. Not that anybody in here was saying they want that, but there are right. news stories out sure. there like that. And that actually is about um, negativity, victims, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. horror, sadness. Who would want to be part of that? Nobody would want to be part of that. that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's, okay, now we're going get to get to questions. Okay, okay, Linda, go, go, go. go. Yeah, in Arabic. Yeah. Come on, folks, a bunch of reporters. Be prepared. Get with it. Go. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to talk as a Syrian الحقيقة أنا مصابة بخيبة أمل رهيبة جدا جدا لأنه 8 سنين وما قدرنا لليوم ننقل ليفل للعمل الاحترافي بكل شيء اللي شفته حقيقة وأنا رح أحكي مثل ما الصحفيين بيحكوا كتير اندايركت هو تشريح للمشكلة المشرحة أصلا هو عرض لواقع اصلا الكل او بتخيل كل الموجودين هون بيعرفوا شو عم بيصير كوننا صحفيين ف في كثير ملاحظات البدايه هو هو عدم التشبيك مع الاعلام كان جي او كمنظمه عم تشتغل على موضوع كثير مهم لليوم انا ما بسمع فيها مع اني انا بشتغل بالشان السوري وضليت عم بشتغل بالشان السوري لليوم للحظه اثنين بالفيديو في تشريح لمشكلة بس ما في فوكس على مشكلة واحدة في استعراض للمنظمة نفسها أكثر من التركيز على الحالة نفسها ثلاثة واللي هي أصابتني في مقتل اللي هي الأب اللي عم يحكي عن طفلة بينما الطفلة اللي لازم تحكي يعني أنا ما شفت وجه الطفلة ما نعمل فوكس ما عرفت شو بدها ما عرفت شو صاير اكتفيت بالأب اللي عم يحكي عن طفلة يفترض معها تروما معها صدمة حقيقة أنا ما فيني ما أستفز من من هذا النوع من الاستسهال آسفة بعرض المشكلة بحد ذاتها وتسطيح على درجة تخليني بلا مسطحة يعني يعني في مشكلة تروما أنا ما فهمت شيء عن التروما أنا عرفت إنه في قصف في طفلة خايفة ليش خايفة وين كانت شو اللي صار ما عرفت شيء أنا حسيت إني شفت تقرير إخباري I'm so sorry أنا كتير آسفة <تصفيق> بس حسيت إنه هو تقرير إخباري أو دعائي عن ال NGO نفسها عن المنظمة نفسها ما شفت لليوم باللي شفته ما شفت حالي في في يا yeah. آخر شيء بدي أقوله أنا آسفة على الرأي المباشر جدا ما فينا لليوم نقبل أنه نحن ما نعرف نحكي عن حالنا صح وننطر حدا تاني يحكي عننا صح يفترض نحن عملنا كتير تدريبات عملنا كتير تريننج لحتى نوصل لمحل على الأقل نعرف نشرح المشكلة اللي عم نحكي عنها ونعرف نعطي حلول يعني ما فينا لليوم نضلنا بس موقع عم نتلقى الصدمة ونتفاجأ فيها تمن سنين هي كافية للمفاجأة شكرا أنا كتير بشكرك طبعا أنه أنت كنت داركت وأنا بصراحة هذا الفيلم من أربع سنوات فهذا ال I need to speak English. Okay. So this, this, okay. So this, this, okay. You need to put, say, how to. Okay. تمام. تمام. طيب أنا حكي سلوري مش عن ال الترجمة. الفيديو من أربع سنوات. أنا لما رجعت شفته الآن من ناحية نفسية أنا لقيت فيه أخطاء. أنا أنا من إيمك من الصحفية أنا يعني هذا العمل تبعكم. بالنسبة لي حسيت إنه أديش كنت أنا متأثر 
برغبه الصحفيين انه نحكي على البي تي اس دي فانا بالفيديو ذكرت البي تي اس دي بس هلا لو بعود انا ما بذكر البي تي اس دي لانه انا بدي اصحح هذا الموضوع آه الاكاديميكس الجامعات والصحفيين عم بيلحقونا وعندهم تيرم واحد هو البي تي اس دي بدهم معلومات عنه بدهم صور عنه بس نحن الان تعلمنا كثير انه ما لازم نستمر في استخدام البي تي اس دي او التركيز على النموذج الطبي اللي هي عندك ديس اوردر عندك مشكله اضطراب ليبل وساعدك لا الموضوع كبير وفيه ابعاد متعدده هذا اللي لازم نحكي فيه هلا انا بالنسبه لي ممكن يكون كان في شيء عن عمل المنظمه وممكن يكون وجهة نظر انه انت بدك تظهر الريزيلينس آه كمجتمع آه وليس تظهر المعاناة لانه هون كمان في عندي مشكلة انا بإظهار المعاناة يعني الآن هذا السؤال وانا بتذكر يعني من يومين بالريسبشن انه انه كيف فينا نركز على الريزيلينس وستيل نجيب فند ودعم هذا هو تحدي ساعته السؤال مطروح فهذا مثال ممكن يكون من الأمثلة يا, يا ترى أنا ما بدي أركز على المشكلة إذا حدا بدي يقرأ على التروما أو المشكلة ممكن يأخذ دورات متخصصة في الموضوع ولكن لما بدي أفرجيها للعالم بدي أفرجيها بطريقة ربما تكون توصل جزء من من الفكرة ولكن ما تكون سترسفون الحقيقة امبارح أنا كنت ناوي أفرجيكم مثال بالسياق السوري سيء جدا سيء جدا عن الصحافة بس لما شفت الفيديو ما قدرت يعني ما قدرت انا اتحمله لما بتلاقي صحفيه عم تعمل مقابله مع طفلين وامهم ميته جنبهم وبتقول لهم مين هي السيده اللي 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 مقتوله حدكم مثلا ففي في مشاكل عندنا بموضوع الصحافه انا بالنسبه لي اتقبل تماما وانا هي الفرصه كثير حلوه انا برايي انه يجي برسبكتيف من الصحافه برسبكتيف من الصحه النفسيه ونوصل لطريقه لانه انا بدي اياكم تكونوا انفولفد اكثر امبارح كنا عم نقول نحن شاطرين ربما بالعلاج او بالدعم النفسي بس بالادفوكسي ما شاطرين طيب هذا الامر عندكم بس بالمقابل كمان انتم بدكم تقتربوا اكثر من من التخصص تبعنا لتقدروا تنقلوا عنه وبالتالي نحن نشتغل مع بعضنا لفائده الناس فائدة الناس وهذا بيجيبنا لسؤال انه كثير مهم وانا كنت بدي اطرحه انه اي حدا بيروح بيساعد حدا في فائدة لهذا المستفيد بس في فائدة لك كشخص كمنظمة تمام هذا مو عيب بس لازم نكون احنا واعيين قديش فائدتنا احنا كاشخاص انا بدي اعمل ذا بيست ستوري اللي ممكن يصير في فولورز كثير عليها مثلا انا بدي اقوي منظمتي اعلاميا لانه هذا ممكن يجيب لي دعم. فانا في لي فائده بهذا الامر. السؤال هو كيف فينا ندمج كل هي العناصر بطريقه تحقق الفائده للجميع. هذا سؤال مفتوح. انا بالنسبه لي منفتح على اي اجابات واي شيء ممكن انه 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 يطلع وبعتبر هذه بصراحه بدايه لهذا العمل اللي ممكن لاحقا ينبنى عليه كثير شغلات. اتمنى انه يكون جاوبتك على الـ على التعليق شكرا كارلو مارسيا دو يو وانت تو ساي اني ثينج اي جست وانت اي نو ذا بيجينينغ وزنت وات اي وود بروفيشنلي وانت تو ساي ويتش از واي اي وانتيد تو فوكس اون ذا بوزيتيف اسبيكتس ذات اي سو تووردز ذا اند اوف ات اند بيكوز اي هاف ذا موست جريتس ريسبكت فور ماي كوليغ هير از ويل اند وي هاف وركت توجذر ان ذا باست سو Um, that's why I wanted to highlight the positive aspects of that video rather than pick out the negatives because I also believe in the assets in things rather than always pointing out the negative. But I do take your point when you, you pushed back at me then and said the beginning was, uh, was more of the n- negative aspect. Yeah, not just you, th- there's a few yeah. people behind you as well. Not yeah. Yeah. Jane? Thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to make a journalistic point, I guess, which is that I think everyone in this room and almost everyone I know really, you know, suffers a lot in doing these stories because we want things to get better and we want you all to succeed and we we love NGOs that are doing things but there's advocacy journalism in which you are trying to promote an NGO and then there's journalism 
more of the kind of mainstream journalism that, okay, doesn't exist quite so much anymore, but if you're in a place and there are horrible pictures and horrible things going on, we don't, we shouldn't have a filter. Yeah. Are we not going to show this because it's horrible? Because it's reality, that's what it is. If you're doing great things with kids, we're also not going to shy away from showing the causes of that, the horror that they came from. Um, there's that good news, bad news debate. We, we don't deal in good news or bad news generally. Tell me if I'm wrong, journalists right. here. But um, essentially, that's basically what it is. And we have problems sometimes with NGOs because we love you, we really do, but we're not there to promote your organization. Yeah. We are there to tell real stories. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, Florian, and I, I just want to highlight one thing, which I understand Linda's uh, perspective, is that uh, when like two people are talking let's say foreign international journalists, let's say talking, or we analyzing the situation in Syria, from a Syrian perspective, it's like, where's our agency here? Yeah. What, what's our role, in a sense? And you talking about us as if we're not, we can't do anything, we're hopeless to a certain extent. So you have this frustration at the same time as well. Well, yeah. and I, I think we should also be clear, there, there, are, there are a number of sort of tensions in this room and in this group. We, there are the different jobs, the different responsibilities of mental health professionals and journalists, different ethical codes that sometimes come together and sometimes conflict. There also are tensions between people in this room who are reporting primarily for local audiences or primarily for refugee communities or largely for refugee communities and people who are telling stories outward for the outside world. And those are different different kinds of stories too. I just think we need to recognize that we have a number of different missions in this room that are going to uh, sometimes collide. And Linda, I want to thank you for your, your directness. It was very good. Florian. I, I, um, I don't know what the intention of the, uh, the video makers are actually, but I think like one important um, aspect of that video is, I think it's also about self-help, like given your personal story, which is depicted in the video as well. So I think it's, in this case, it would be justified to talk about this a little more because like you know actually what you're talking about. You're not like coming in from the outside. I mean, like you, you live through this, you have personal history, and this is part of the organization. So I, I understand the frustration a bit, but I think in this case, the story is also about you. Um, Um, okay, concerning the NGO thing, and as, as a storytellers, we are, as a journalist, we should be a storytellers, and this is a new approach of making successful stories, yeah. and I think most of NGOs have this, this approach for us. So uh, I personally don't find it wrong to, to approach a problem uh, with a success story of an NGO, but might, it might be that this report itself took 80% for the NGO and not for the focus. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we started with this girl, and we see this girl in the room with the other boys, and this is another question, why are they all boys <laughs> in, that, in that class? Uh, so if we see her in that class, and then it ends up with her being better, speaking about herself better, then this might be a lot of more protagonist of the girl, yeah. but we still see the NGO. So yeah. this is only yeah, another no, opinion. And, and yesterday, Sarah Stillman mentioned in passing Solutions Journalism and the Solutions Journalism Network. Um, it's really worth looking at their website because uh, what they advocate is finding ways of integrating positive developments and science and n programs and all this without it becoming soft, happy talk journalism or without it obscuring the, the difficult stories underneath. I think there is a way to do it and we're, we're gradually learning how to do it. And I think that's the other thing. You all are innovators in trying to figure out how to do this. Anyway. Yeah, go. Unfortunately, the organization in Jordan has just closed. And now you can see, we, because we have also problem with international NGOs and UN agencies. They get uh, a lot of money a lot part of money, we left with only small uh, that we can survive and sometimes we are not able to survive. 
And you are now even telling us we should not show our success story. So, <laughs> we, I mean, we will die. So the local empowered, empowered uh, success stories are dying. Okay, so, so let's see it in this perspective, actually. And, and if you want to talk about the real causes, actually, I, I can open like a lot of perspectives, actually. But I promise that I just keep it dry. So I just focused on like more professional. But, but things are complicated. I don't believe that we are able to solve the problems. And we need help. So please, even you don't think that you can solve all the problems. There's a lot of problems that nobody knows how to solve it. We need to, to work together, actually. I'm open to, 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 to learn, and maybe next time I will uh, ask the, anyone who wants to, to film the video, and you are invited to film uh, our, in our organization, <laughs> to, okay, make it like 50%, 50%, or, or whatever uh, percentage you are, agree on, so I'm, I'm open to that. <laughs> okay. Let's try to keep, uh, it's up, but keep questions focused, because there are a lot of people who want to talk, and I want to make sure you get it. Uh, I'll ask in Arabic, maybe it will be easier for Dr. Muhammad. يعطيك العافية دكتور محمد أول شيء بدي أشكرك أنت أكيد مصدر إلهام لكثير ناس من اللي حولك وحتى في المجتمع بشكل عام سواء كانوا من إخواننا السوريين أو غيره سؤالي بالنسبة لهل يمكن أنك تذكر لنا بدون ذكر المراسل أو الجهة الصحفية قصة صحفية كنمط بتساعدكم في مجال عملكم بعيدا عن الترويج الدعائي للمنظمات بعينها يعني كيف القصة الصحفية ممكن تساعد أو يكون إلها دور في 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 إنها توضح أو تساعد البروفيشنز في مجال الصحة النفسية وبالجانب الآخر هل تعتقد إنه في جوانب في أثناء سعي الصحفيين لتغطية هوت توبكس أو ترندز معينة أغفلوها أو قصروا في تغطيتها في مجال عملك؟ سؤال أول أنا أنا إذا بدي أقول شو ماذا يجب أن تغطيته واللي هو فيه نقص آه التجارب الناجحة على المستوى المجتمع نحن الآن نعاني في عنا منطقة نحن نعتبرها محررة في شمال غرب سوريا الكثير من القصص الناجحة التي قام فيها شباب ونساء ورجال مبادرات محلية آه رائعة جدا لا يظهر فيها من الإعلام الغربي والإعلام الشرقي إلا قصص الحرب وداعش والنظام آه فأرجوكم آه بعيدا عن المنظمات أنا مستعد أنه يعني أوكي نعطي كل مواردنا ونوصل نوصلكم مع كل القصص الفردية من النجاح حتى يكون في قناة وأرجو أنه يعني يكون هي مبادرة قناة خاصة في التواصل مع الناس مباشرة أنا في عندي تيم 100 و 200 شخص في الداخل تواصل مباشر مع قصص النجاح الموجودة لحتى تظهروها بعضهم كان عم يعاني من شيء وهو بعدين تعافى وبعدين هو قام بمبادره هذا ممكن يكون كثير له 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 اثر تمام فانا هذا بصراحه اللي بحثكم انكم تركزوا عليه وهذا هو الجاب السؤال الثاني اللي اللي هو فيه تحدي بصراحه هل نحن كصحفيين واعيين للترشري جين اللي مسميه إحنا شو بدنا كصحفيين؟ برجع بأكد على هي النقطة دائماً نحن عندنا كبروفيشنال هدف داخلي هل إحنا واعيين إله ولا ما نواعيين إله؟ إحنا عم نعمل ديناية لا إحنا أنا بس بدي أساعد الناس هل إحنا واعيين إله؟ هذا بسموه تأمل ذاتي قدرة على التأمل الذاتي وهذا شيء كتير ضروري عندنا في التخصص أنتوا هل عندكم القدرة على ذلك؟ وبعدين تقدروا تتعاملوا مع هي الحاجة الداخلية والرغبة الداخلية بطريقة إنكم تساعدوا الاخرين وتحافظوا على هي الرغبه الداخليه انا برايي هذا هذا تحدي كبير لما عم لما عم ينفيد هذا الموضوع عم تروح القصص نحو الاثاره او نحو ربما توجهات اخرى كما يريده المستمعون ما يطلبه المستمعون وهذا التوجه للاسف اللي اللي هو كثير يعني ترند موجود وعم عم ياذي كثير ارجو ان يكون جاوبت على اسئلتك تمام اوكي انا ليزا Thank you so much. That was really interesting. And you had sent me this video when I, um, when I requested an interview with you a few um, weeks ago about, about your project. And I thought one of the most interesting things for me in that video was the part that you took out, that exchange that you have with one kid. Um, I thought that was a very 
powerful exchange. Um, it's, it's basically Dr. Abu Hilal interviewing one of the child, one of the children, and the children, the child is telling him what happened and is telling him, not the journalist. So you, as a viewer, get a, 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 you get into that room and you, and then it goes back into the discussion we had yesterday about you don't interview the ch the child directly, but you get access to what the child experienced. And I thought that was very powerful. And I think what we're talking about here in terms of um, working together, as you said, is a relationship of trust between journalists and NGOs. I'm not talking about uh, promoting the work of NGOs, as, as Jane said. There's, there's also, there's a difference there. I think we could, we could well work together, not necessarily only promoting the work. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about going somewhere and part of the story being a success story like your NGO, but also talking about the trauma. Um, yesterday I mentioned the possibility of training. Uh, this is what we're doing here. We're learning more about why what we do also has an impact on the children. How we interview this children, these children is also important. And I mentioned the possibility of NGOs working with us. And for example, MSF had a wonderful way of doing this before I boarded Aquarius. They sent me a bunch of material that I needed to read. And the day before we boarded, we talked and we did a briefing about how, what were the conduct codes. And, and then we were left to do our work. And, I, and that's what I meant about training yesterday. Because then the MSF trusted us that we had the information and we, we signed a conduct code paper. And so once we were on that boat, they were not saying, you can't do that, you can't access that child. We knew what we could and couldn't do, and then it was up to us to follow the rules or not. And that established a relationship of trust, and I think we all gain from trust on this level and in the world. Okay, so a couple of things. I was also was on the Aquarius for three weeks and I was banned doing my work. So that's not necessarily true. Um, my biggest issue is that I don't think NGOs understand the role of journalism or journalists. And we aren't there to promote your work as much as we believe in it. Um, and as much as we want to work together, I'm not there to work together, really. I'm there to get a story, I'm there to tell a truth, and I'm there to document what's happening. Otherwise, I don't really, I mean, the only problem is really is that the Syria crisis has shown that the gatekeepers of that truth is the governments and the NGOs. And we don't have free access, but we don't have free access because there isn't trust going both ways. We are putting our trust in you that you're going to give us access to people, but in return what we get is usually people who are set up, multiple times interviewed by many different journalists, um, only particular people we are given. We are not allowed access to victims of trauma and trusted that we can ethically do our job. I understand everybody's been like once bitten, twice shy, but um, the reality is that we still need that access. And um, I'm not there to do anybody else's job. I'm there to do mine. And um, I don't need certificates from an NGO to tell me how to do my job. I go to workshops like this and I know exactly how to ethically conduct and morally conduct my job. So um, I'm really sorry, but I started to get really frustrated yeah. because um, I think that just as much as we understand how NGOs work, I don't think NGOs understand how journalism works. And I, let me, now let me intervene a little bit and say that w one of the secret goals of this workshop um, is in fact to help build some relationships of trust and to begin some conversations that need to happen. So it, this, this, is, this kind of clarity about the different professional needs of the mental health providers, the NGOs, the journalists, is a conversation that has to happen. It's really important. Okay, so yeah, Jeremy. Uh, picking up on Florian's point, I thought the most effective and moving part of the video is your personal story. I admire your bravery. That was quite effective, uh, sharing your story. The, the question I have is about post-traumatic growth. And that was a really interesting and fascinating point for me, and I'm interested to hear examples of that. Can you cite specific examples of people who are experiencing post-traumatic growth? What does that look like? Uh, 
um, we had a, a term in, in, in okay. I, I speak in Arabic. Okay. Okay. Uh, لأنه في باللغة العربية بيقول الضرب التي لا تقتلك تجعلك أقوى. ما بعرف زي يعني موجودة نفسه. فتقريبا هذا هو نفسه المعنى. إنه كرد فعلك أنت على الأزمة بتحرض عندك قضايا بتنميها لتواجهها وبالتالي بتضل معك هي القوة اللي أنت طورتها من أجل المستقبل. بالنسبة لنا الأمثلة طرحت أنا المثال كثير مثلا من سيدات أرامل عملوا مثلا جمعيات ليساعدوا السيدات الأرامل هي السيدة لو بقيت متزوجة بحياتها العادية ربما ما لح تفكر أبدا أنها تساوي أي خطوة خارج المنزل تبعها بعض النساء اللي كانوا ربات منزل لما صارت الأزمة فصاروا مثلا يروحوا يعملوا مطابخ ليساعدوا اللاجئين تمام فرغم انه هن بنفس الـ 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 الوضع اللي اللي باقي عايش فيه بس حست انه في عندها امكانيات هي فيها تساعد الاخرين فهن كلياتهم تعرضوا لصدمات بس ناس صار في عندها اعراض وناس قاومت وناس تحولت بنسميها المحنه الى منحه وصار إلها دور بصراحة بالسياق السوري كثير من الشباب اللي ما كان عنده اهتمام أبدا بالسياسة ما كان عنده اهتمام أبدا بالشأن العام لما صارت هي الأزمة صار في كثير عندهم وعي واهتمام حتى منهم كثير من الشباب اللي صاروا صحفيين يعني إحنا موضوع الصحافة صار كثير موجود عندنا في سوريا مع أنه ما في هي الدراسة هذا الأمر كان كثير له بصراحه الناس تفعلت الامكانيات تبعهم وهذا بالنسبه لنا يعني اجين انا اسف اريل بس انه يقال لنا انه ما كان احسن لكم ضلوا ساكتين وعايشين بسلام انا برايي الشيء اللي انجزناه وحققناه وعشناه يستحق كل التضحيات ولو عدنا لسوي نفس الامر نحن نعيش الان بحريه كل امكانياتنا موجوده لما لما انا بكون بسوريا على مستوى أعمل تجمع صغير هذا اللي حكينا لكم عنه بال2008 إذا بدي أسجله لازم يكون في عندي الأمن أو المخابرات يشيكوا على الأسماء تبعنا ويعطوا موافقة الآن أنا في مكان قادر أسوي فيه الكثير من المبادرات والأعمال فأنا بعتقد أنه هذا الأمر كثير خلانا تنطلق الإمكانيات تبعنا بشكل كثير كبير ما بعرف اذا هذا بيجاوبك على على الامثله من من وجهه نظري بس yeah. هو موضوع كبير البي تي جي يعني. Yeah, I think Khaled wants to say something and then I, I actually want to say something. Yeah, yeah. Else. very quickly. Um, we usually say that you need you, you need great anger to change a dysfunctional situation uh, or or in, an internal situation. Like usually anger is if you channel it in a positive coping mechanism, because usually when it comes to trauma, you, you either go for negative coping, um, and sometimes, no, you, you go for, and this is our job as therapists sometimes, to, to channel them towards more positive coping. So yeah. once you're there with this enough anger inside you, you can grow. And this is the benefit of trauma in itself. I'm, I'm saying benefit, it has a benefit, which is the idea of growth to channel this anger forward in a positive way. Let, let me just add to this that post, post-traumatic growth is a, a clinical term that, about which there actually is a big body of research uh, in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, there's some You can get some background on it on the DART Center website, but if you're interested in it, I can also steer you towards some of the big people who are doing studies on this. It's a, there's a lot of argument about clinicians about what exactly it is, but it is a term, a, a clinical term of art, and it's a field that is being studied very actively right now in a very scientific, a rigorous scientific way. Uh, Zaka, you've been trying for a while. Sorry, uh, I would not refer to the video. Uh, I would like to know, uh, since you were working in the camp, and now you are working in those pockets, of, I presume there is a lot of interna uh, um, displaced people, uh, can you tell me, is there a difference in dealing with trauma uh, with people 
are they experiencing different kind of trauma and living in the camp and living in this pockets where they can not move so f I mean they can move freely but they cannot travel through the country and everything else so is there any difference in between for you when you were working with them actually specifically there's no uh, like difference re uh, regarding this but it depends about the situation of the camp mm -hmm. and the living situation so you will have uh, people who are living in rural areas or urban areas their situation are much bad much worse than people who are living in a stable camp okay so like in turkey there's like uh, in camps are provided with all services okay but some rural areas there's like a lot of poverty so so people like it depends about the situation of the the camps and the uh, uh where they are displaced or, or, or living this is this is what i like uh, sense actually uh, of this difference So again, I've worked in the urban settings as well as the camps for the last three years. And so I think um, just to, to kind of go a little bit further, it's, it's the daily stresses that are incredibly different. So, um, you know, in an urban setting, yes, they have more freedom of movement and they may be living more like a community, a small community, but with lack of, of uh, other services. But you may be in a camp with services, but still high frustrations because you have a lack of freedom of movement. You uh, are unable to contact your relatives who might be in the next camp um, or, or still back in Syria. You know, so I think I think the level of frustration could be similar, but it's the accumulation of different types of stresses. And again, when we were trying to highlight yesterday is that range of individual difference, like each family, each ind individual child or adult is going to have a different layer of uh, buffer factors as well as resilience, as well as then distress. So it's, it's really hard to capture this because one of the beautiful things is we're all individually different, but it's also impossible as a mental health practitioner to, uh, you know, label people so neatly. For, for, for that is the importance of not thinking on like I need to diagnose him or I need to uh, I you know I need to like uh, categorize the idea is we need to individualize like each person has his own story so from uh, mental health perspectives you need to understand and provide a container for them so they are able to live in a trustful relation where they can grow themselves and learn how to deal with their own problems without need to diagnose him or label him. And this will help like 70, 80 percent of, of people. So, yeah. So everyone has his own uh, actually story. Uh, yeah. I, I hope this answer I'll give this idea. Uh, if I just may add, uh, I thought uh, primarily the fact that living in a camp is not something, um, how to say that in English? always the same problem it's it's not permanent it's not permanent you know you cannot uh, focus on your uh, long life achievements you are just there for for i don't know how much time and then at the end you stay there for 20 years for example this is what i was thinking primarily so but thank you Actually, you need to visit zatari camp there is like a street called chanzilaze okay and a lot of shops Actually, you'll be amazing that you find such kind of shops there. This is a life, actually, amazing life. You, you, you're going to uh, go there. I know this four years ago. I didn't go, for, 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 but I think now it is like m even more advanced. And these people are, are living and having a lot of work and uh, earning money. So I think, I think, yeah, situation may be different than what we yeah. expect. Those are the different okay, Uh, so I'm just going to go back to this uh, tension that we have between journalism and NGO work. Sorry, because I really want to get over this and I want to understand. Um, so I'm trying to draw, I'm, I have a question at the end of this, but I'm just going to go for a rant. Um, yes, I'm trying to draw parallels between methods that you would use in um, psychotherapy and then methods I would use in storytelling. And then my own experience having gone through therapy. At some point during my therapy, to get to that success story, I had to re revisit the point of trauma. And when I'm telling a success story or solutions-based story as a journalist, I will need the full context of that story, and I'll have to revisit the point of trauma, however briefly. And I think that we, I, I do, at least, and I think that many of my colleagues um, 
have the same desire as NGO workers. And so um, I wanted to ask genuinely, what is wrong with, with revisiting a point of trauma to end up telling that post-traumatic growth or success story? Um, I have solution for you, actually. <laughs> we have a therapy called uh, narrative exposure therapy, which include that you help the client to rewrite and formulate all his story. And this itself can be helpful and healing for him. Okay? So the idea is you gotta learn this, okay? And then you get his permission and be prepared you as a person and him that we will revisit your story and you are fine. So, I mean, we don't have like, you should not revisit, uh, but there's like occasions that you take his permission, you know what he will go through, you will know yourselves, how to deal with your, with your emotion, where you are hearing about this, because also you will have like a, some type of trauma yourselves, and then your memory will be, uh, start to be elective, like not uh, hearing. So I think this is a good approach, but it's need from your side actually to have more training on this, and this would be uh, very helpful, uh, uh, I think. And I, 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 I you, this I'm answer so your sorry. question. All right. All right. With all, with all, with all gonna, due respect, oh, I'm so more. sorry. I'm going to have to disagree with you, and you yeah. know I have the utmost respect for you. There's a lot of research and evidence globally um, in very many different countries where the cultural ethics and the professional ethics of narrative exposure therapy actually does more harm the same way we never use debriefing anymore. So I just want to add that. So when one of the, I, and let me just contextualize this. There are some big arguments in science about trauma, and I believe in airing those arguments, and you've just gotten an example of a small one. Jane West has been jumping up and down screaming, so you get to be the last question. And then we, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I was very interested that you called your work Syria Psychology, you know, for a variety of reasons that you explained. And I'm wondering for all three of you how much you feel you're constantly bumping up against what we could call the Western medicalized model of psychology. There are variations of that now that are less medicalized even in the Western world where it emerged, but how much does it feel like psychology is the province of the region in which it's existing, or how much is it feeling hijacked from elsewhere, brought here, and doesn't fit, and there's constant <coughs> friction. Does that, does the question make sense? Okay. Yep. Sure. Compared to you two, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I feel m more comfortable with it being a homegrown uh, mental health system and set of interventions in this region than I've done in any other region. Um, and I genuinely think there, has, there is a lot of expertise, whether it's from community-based organisations or individuals through to already trained professionals across the region who have um, spoken up loud and proud about their own professional qualifications and their legitimate experience and have helped shape um, what mental health intervention looks like, I think, personally. Now, having said that, though, have all INGOs gone that way? I'm not saying that, but as an individual mental health practitioner, every colleague I've met in this region in terms of who are homegrown, I absolutely think they have infused um, culturally appropriate knowledge, expertise, and it's a very good fit for mental health work. But not it doesn't mean that all INGOs follow that. Uh, from my perspective is that, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, like one big challenge which, uh, which is like Western uh, methodologies sometimes, especially my, the way I work, I focus a lot on emotions. I, I'm emotion-based uh, to a certain extent therapist. Um, and in, in a culture that is a bit sometimes, you no know, man up, like um, man or we, uh, emotions are weaknesses, are, are, are portrayed, framed as weaknesses. Uh, so yes, this is a challenge for ma mainly, for example, m most of 80% of people that I meet are females rather than males, for example. So from male, female, gender perspective, the, m the, f the male, the father, let's say, he's, he shies away usually. I will deal with this by myself. So it, it has also a gender issue. Um, 
and another challenge which is sometimes in, in certain communities uh, you have this stigma of, of therapy in general and mainly they see that religion is the solution of all things to a certain extent um, and disregarding what's in what, what what do they mean exactly they don't actually so sometimes they it's like therapy versus religion to a certain extent what I usually do is, is that I take advantage of the community itself by highlighting more the social support I don't just uh, it's not the individual, individual per se, it's, it's, it's a whole system, as I said before, and I want the whole family, even the extended family, to be more supportive of, of the person. This is one aspect. The second one is spirituality. We have a very positive coping mechanism, a traditional coping mechanism for each society. So we need to take advantage of this. So I highlight the spiritual aspect. Yeah. So, um because I like to defect, now I will defect from NGOs. <laughs> but, but this, but this keep like, yeah. So, so I, I will tell you a sad uh, survey that I did with a sad results regarding this. Um, there was a, a faith sensitive approach was issued by Islamic Relief and Lutheran Federation, two big organization, one Islamic, one Christian, about faith sensitivity approaches. And when I learned this or read it, I did a survey among Syrian professionals and interested people, and I got one, 180 respondents, okay? So some of the question was, was like, um, did you do uh, religious, did you include religious or spiritual activities in your project, although it is not in your original proposal? And 70 people, uh, uh, 70 people say, yes, we do that. Now, when I ask him, did you report this activity to your donor? Only 40% of them report that, okay? So this is the st sad story of our NGOs. Because we are small, because we are in you, so, I mean, we need to obey the donor's, uh, you know, uh, attitudes or, or, or knowledge. And because we are feeling that, okay, um, if we we'll include this religious activity, we'll be losing this uh, fund. So we'll be following their uh, uh, rules, actually, uh, in that. So this is the sad reality. We, we have a very rich uh, literature in this. However, we are not empowered enough as the Syrian professionals to, to say that, we need this or we think this or not. Even uh, she said about like, okay, uh, traumatic therapy is like uh, narrative therapy. Is it like uh, acceptable or not acceptable? Actually, this is all Western discussions. We don't have any, any say, but I, I would say that we have a lot of rich uh, uh, knowledge and practices yeah. that we can build on. But unfortunately, there's no study and I'm telling you frankly, I, I, I presented this result and, and the donors will say, okay, we don't want to engage in this. Yeah. But anyway, w I'm interested actually in learning more about this, uh, especially after these guidelines have been issued actually uh, internationally uh, about how to approach these faith uh, things. And I think we just started in, in this and hopefully we can get to a point where we have our own approaches that is very related to our culture and, and uh, yeah, society. Okay, thank you. thank you. Now listen, I know there are many more questions in the room and many more arguments to be had, um, but we have to stop. So you can continue questions and arguments in the coffee, in the courtyard for the next 15 minutes. We will take a 15 minute break and then come back for our next panel, which will extend this discussion. And I thank, first of all, thank all three of you, but Mohammed in particular. We are honored by your presence and participation. And thank all of you as well for your many direct interventions. <laughs>